Great. Uh, good morning and welcome to the fourth annual series of Policy Dialogue with Professor Anthony Jern. This dialogue series is co-organized by the Department of Asian and Policy Study and the Academy, Academy of Hong Kong Studies of the Education University of Hong Kong, together with the Division of Public Policy at the Hong Kong UST. Throughout this year, Professor Anthony Jern, former Secretary for Transport and Housing, and now Research Chair Professor of Public Administration at, at UHK and adjunct Professor at Hong Kong UST, will share his views and analysis on critical issues in Hong Kong's political, economic, and social development. In addition to Professor Jern, each dialogue features one to two prominent figures in the field. We hope that these dialogues will cont contribute to a deeper appreciation of the complexity of the issue that we are facing collectively and stimulate exchanges of ideas both within and outside the academia. So I'm Shuya Li, acting head of the Department of Asian and Policy Studies, the moderator of today's discussion. Today, we will talk about the status and future of the one country, two systems. I think all of us would agree that this is an important topic, if not the most important one in Hong Kong today. In fact, last year, we also began the dialogue series with a similar topic. So much has happened just since then. Uh, the electoral reform, the implementation of the national security law, changing international relations, and the ongoing threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's hard to believe that all this happened just in a year. And today, our key question is whether these changes represent a reboot or retreat of the one country, two systems. Joining Professor Anthony Jern today, we have Professor Tai Lok Lui, who is Chair Professor of Hong Kong Study in our department and the Director of the Academy of Hong Kong Studies. Also, we have Dr. Henry Ho, who is the Founder and Chairman of One Country, Two System Youth Forum. Dr. Ho is currently a member of the Basic Law Promotion Steering Committee and a council member of the Chinese Association of Hong Kong and Macau Studies. All three speakers have written and commented extensively on issues related to the One Country, Two System. So I'm sure there will be a vibrant discussion today. Without further ado, now I will invite the three speakers to each deliver a 20 minutes presentation. This will be followed by a round table discussion. We encourage you to actively participate in our discussion by submitting your comments or questions in the chat room. We'll incorporate them into our discussion later. So may I introduce, may I invite Professor Jern to start the discussion first? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, the topic today is very uh, important, uh, especially given what happened uh, in the past two years. Uh, one country, two systems, when it was introduced as a concept in the 1980s, was regarded as rather novel. Uh, it is not uncommon that within one country, you have two cultures, two uh, ethnic groups, uh, to uh, language communities, or even two traditions, uh, two religious groups. But if you have two systems, which uh, theoretically are rather uh, opposing socialism versus capitalism, then it's really a creative idea. Uh, it's like uh, trying to achieve the possible out of the impossible. Now, and I think uh, Hong Kong's path uh, since the 1990s in terms of transition uh, towards reunification with China in 1997 uh, and implementing one country, two systems, have told us a lot about how to make uh, this creative concept work. And uh, over two decades afterwards, I think we have come to a very critical point in terms of how to chart the, the, the course forward. Now, what happened in the last two years, of course, uh, have, have given, has given people a lot of thought about whether uh, this one country, two systems idea can still uh, 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 work to all size satisfaction. And there is pessimism, there is skepticism about the prospect of one country, two systems. Now, before we look at the current situation, let us uh, uh, spend a little bit of time in reflecting on uh, the, the history, so to speak, and the foundation of this very important uh, concept, which uh, is 
the basis of Hong Kong's constitutional uh, arrangement. Okay, let me use the PowerPoint now. Sorry. Um, Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, now the first question is why and how? Why do we have one country, two systems? There are many uh, ways to look at it. First, uh, the uh, the need for preservation and continuity of Hong Kong system after 1997. Politically, it could be regarded as a kind of historical compromise. And uh, the central government in Beijing at that time was rather flexible. Uh, Article 31 was added to the PRC constitution, which enabled uh, the, the, the central government to uh, set up any special administrative region, uh, which could have uh, uh, special systems and institutional arrangement. But at that time in the 1980s, Hong Kong was regarded as a very uh, thriving uh, capitalist system, which could provide uh, some kind of role model for the maintenance reform and opening up. In fact, our Hong Kong business people were the first batch of investors uh, on the mainland. If you look at the basic law, uh, there are all kinds of safeguards regarding preserving the Hong Kong uh, institutions and various systems, including uh, uh, sports, education, social welfare, the financial center, the Hong Kong currency, so on and so forth. And we can look at the relevant chapters of the basic law. The basic law also uh, provides a special status uh, for Hong Kong as Hong Kong China. And under this, uh, uh, role, Hong Kong could enter into international agreements and uh, uh, treaties uh, regarding trade and economic affairs. The continuity of uh, the previous system or way of life uh, is not just a constitutional stipulation because it is um, it embodies uh, a rather complex uh, range of factors, historical, sociological, institutional, and cultural factors, which together uh, form the foundation of the Hong Kong system and identity. Because of the notion of uh, continuity, so in a way, uh, preserving the Hong Kong system at that time meant preserving the British legacy, the, the kind of uh, what I would describe as Hong Kong uh, exceptionalism, exceptionalism in terms of Hong Kong being quite different from the usual uh, systemic arrangement and Hong Kong hybridity in terms of combining uh, East and West or after 97, the British legacy and whatever uh, was new at that time uh, after Hong Kong became a special administrative region of China. So that kind of preservation is important uh, to us in terms of understanding the foundation of the Hong Kong system. Uh, the other uh, aspect, which is equally important, is the um, stipulation in the basic law, uh, the kind of Hong Kong separateness from the rest of China. Hong Kong somehow was given a special role, a special status. And in the basic law, uh, there was also a special stipulation regarding the Hong Kong identity. And that identity could be dated to uh, the time before uh, Sino-British uh, negotiation in the 1980s. Because uh, before that, in the 1970s, the British administration in Hong Kong was rather keen in promoting the notion of Hong Kong belonger. And of course, legally speaking, a Hong Kong belonger 
referred to people who, hold, who held a Hong Kong identity card, a permanent identity card. So in the basic law, that identity was continued. Uh, if you look at the basic law, it is stipulated that uh, uh, the Hong Kong permanent residence will be the foundation of, for the definition of political rights and some other rights as well. And, and that became uh, uh, the origin of what now we, we, we refer to as Hong Kong Earth. So it's not, it's not just the ethnic uh, definition, it's more to do with uh, part of the continuity of the past. And I've talked about Hong Kong's external identity uh, prescribed in the basic law, meaning Hong Kong, China. And, and that enables Hong Kong to have, um, uh, to be active on the international scene in various economic, trade, and or cultural and other activities. So the status quo as at the 1980s was preserved through the basic law in a very constitutional way. But preservation is not just the only element of continuity or, or, of that change because Hong Kong became a special administrative region of China and therefore it has to fit into the PRC constitutional order. And the PRC is a unitary state, a PRC constitution stipulates that China is under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. So, uh, so that kind of combination of the past and Hong Kong's new position within the PRC constitutional order, I think that could also be regarded as hybrid, hybridity, the kind of post-1997 exceptionalism if we would like to consider Hong Kong that way. Looking back, we can say that uh, there have been tensions between the two systems within one country. Uh, and those tensions became more serious in the, in, in the recent years. And what happened uh, in, 1920, uh, in 2019 and 2020, in a way, was uh, was uh, an, in, uh, 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 an implosion of those contradictions. On the Hong Kong side, if we uh, recall, uh, there have been uh, uh, incidents uh, relating to the fear of disappearance, whether the English language was still valued. Remember the medium of instruction debate right after reunification, the status of Cantonese, uh, whether Hong Kong could be more active in preserving the Hong Kong heritage, and basically that, that means the uh, colonial heritage, cultural features, core values. And uh, among the younger generation, there has been uh, 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 a more a strong urge to uh, reassert the local. And fear of losing uh, something that would be regarded as uh, of Hong Kong feature. Uh, I think that is also very prominent over the last uh, two decades. Uh, so the Article 23 debate, the national education debate, the extradition controversy, apart from the political elements, I think culturally and in terms of uh, uh, this um, uh, worry about uh, losing something, uh, something that was regarded as uh, being part of the past or part of the continuity. I think that is uh, significant if we want to really understand the tensions. And, and then the politics of democratization, uh, which has been uh, haunting Hong Kong ever since 1997. And nowadays, of course, we have two opposing ideological and identity discourses, the blue camp, uh, the, the, the yellow camp, and then the, the concern about Hong Kong uh, being uh, planned uh, or meningized, according to some critics. But of course, on the other side, there's more, there's equally uh, strong concern about Hong Kong not being integrated with the nation. So this tension, I think, uh, has been underlying the 
the practice of one country, two systems ever since 1997. On the mainland side, on the part of the Central People's Government, CPG, uh, concern has also grown uh, uh, in relation to whether uh, in, in relation to the implication of the reunification. Uh, this fear of recovering the territory without the heart, meaning people in Hong Kong, they, they are still not strongly identified with the nation. And after the 2003, uh, Article 23 protests, uh, there is confidence, uh, loss of confidence uh, in the previous non-intervention policy. So we can see that there's a shift in the Hong Kong policy towards uh, intervention. And here I quote uh, a phrase used by the, uh, uh, a, a former um, member of the Basic Law Drafting Committee, <coughs> Professor Xiao, who uh, was passed, was passed away. He used to be the uh, a professor at the Peking University, a law professor at the Peking University. And he said in 2004, I remember, and he said, from now on, we have to have control over Hong Kong to the very bottom. So that indicates the concern about the ineffectiveness of the previous hands of policy uh, towards Hong Kong. And increasingly, there's concern about the uh, lack of national identity of young people in Hong Kong. Uh, so since 2004, there was this patriotism uh, discourse. So the concern about the lack of patriotism is not something new. It's not something that grew out of nothing in the recent two years. Uh, 2012, because of the protests against national education, I think that concern about whether uh, there is national identity in Hong Kong uh, became more prominent and more pressing for uh, policymakers in Beijing. Apart from tensions and sometimes uh, conflicts, uh, uh, there has been cooperation, there has been integration to some extent, uh, because Hong Kong has always been uh, the gateway to the mainland, has always been the intermediary uh, between the mainland and the rest of the world. And therefore, uh, some kind of uh, integration, cooperation has always been there. And after 2003, uh, in order to support Hong Kong, in order to uh, make sure that Hong Kong's economy will not, will not uh, go backward, so that there, there have been more economic support measures, including SIPA, uh, the closer economic uh, uh, partnership uh, arrangement with Hong Kong. And Hong Kong and Macau uh, were first included in the national five-year plans in 2006. And the objective of integration in terms of uh, daily life uh, is to enable a one hour sphere of living for Hong Kong with the, with the Delta region. So we have uh, major uh, cross-boundary infrastructure and connectivity projects like the XRL, the, 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 um, the, uh, the high-speed rail uh, link between Hong Kong and uh, Shenzhen and Guangzhou the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge and, and, and the rest of it. And um, Hong Kong has been encouraged to take part in regional uh, platforms and intercity, uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, cooperation uh, discussions. Uh, the latest uh, arrangement regarding the Greater Bay Area development, I think that is uh, uh, the most important uh, form of regional cooperation at the time. Now, um, serving the nation is now regarded as uh, a very uh, important mission for Hong Kong to serve national needs where Hong Kong is the best. So, so we can see that until 2019, there have been tensions, but at the same time, there have been uh, efforts to promote cooperation and integration.
caches have become more prominent uh, uh, in recent years. Now, I, I, I think we can uh, highlight those uh, caches and incompatibilities uh, into several aspects. The democratization, controversies, central SAR relations, which are gradually moving, the concern about Hong Kong people not, not patriotic enough, that economically, Hong Kong has become less relevant because if we, if we just look at the GDP. In the early 1990s, Hong Kong's GDP was close to 30% of mainland GDP. And nowadays, the latest uh, uh, figure is around 2.2%. So you can see a difference. And on the mainland, uh, there's more self-confidence in the socialist system and the China method. Inasmuch as there is rising Hong Kong localism on the mainland, there is also rising nationalism. So the tension has been building up. And then because of what happened in 2019 regarding the extradition controversy, so, so everything came together. And then we have the most uh, serious uh, political crisis in Hong Kong. Uh, the relationship between the two systems has uh, grown from mutual acceptance gradually to mutual distrust and Hong Kong's loyalty is being questioned. Now, if that question is not properly addressed, then of course the, the whole prospect of one country, two systems uh, might be uh, affected and even eroded. Now, what happened since the 2014 Occupy Central Movement is that uh, the CPG has uh, reaffirmed its jurisdiction, comprehensive jurisdiction of Hong Kong, the 2014 White Paper. And uh, the CPG also set very clear red lines. I remember President Xi Jinping in 2016 said, there's absolutely no room for Hong Kong independence, no compromise on national sovereignty and territorial integrity. So that statement was already made before 2019. But the 2019 unrest uh, made the situation even more serious. And on the part of Beijing, uh, the situation in Hong Kong was interpreted as tantamount to a color uh, revolution. So that, that is really unfortunate uh, that uh, the events in 2019 uh, became a, a game changer for Hong Kong. So the dividing line is 2019 and 2020, miscalculations on all sides and serious backfire. And Hong Kong became virtually a battleground in the new Cold War on China by the US. There was a final showdown uh, and then uh, Beijing decided to impose a Hong Kong national security law and to remake the Hong Kong uh, political order through uh, what is uh, described as enhancing the electoral system uh, to create a new patriotic political class. Now, meanwhile, of course, we have the we have seen the U.S. and Western uh, governments imposing sanctions on Hong Kong. And, and, and Hong Kong was squeezed in between. And uh, uh, on the slide, I said, uh, there is this false logic of destroying a village in order to save it. So uh, internally, uh, there is also a notable uh, phenomenon, what can be described as political withdrawal syndrome on the part of the pro-democrats. So right now, the situation is still rather unsettled, despite uh, new elections uh, now uh, moving forward. So next question is, how do we see the prospect of one country, two systems at this point? Now, the clash between two existentialisms and two identities are quite uh, clear. Uh, And the pain of integration is also seen, despite at the same time, we have the gain from integration. And ultimately, Hong Kong has to be integrated. 
with the rest of China? And how do we reconcile the two opposing, uh, seemingly opposing politics of identity? How do we overcome uh, any uh, pessimistic, fatalist uh, perceptions about the future, whether or not there could be some kind of uh, uh, compromise, some, time, some kind of uh, more tolerant acceptance, uh, acceptance of uh, the future. So uh, if we have two different existentialisms, can we have a third existentialism that could transcend existing existentialism for Hong Kong? So these are some of the questions that uh, people in Hong Kong uh, have to consider. The new starting points for uh, the post-2020 Hong Kong are quite clear. We have entered uh, what can be described as second transition. The first transition was in 1997. Now we are into the second transition uh, of this process of one country, two systems. And uh, here I have identified a few points which are made clear by the Central People's Government. One country is paramount. So there must be no threat to national security, especially in this new Cold War period. Uh, the Central People's Government has comprehensive jurisdiction over the SAR. And because of the lack of trust uh, in the pandemics, so therefore uh, Beijing has to reassert importance of patriots uh, administering Hong Kong. Hong Kong has to integrate into national uh, development path. So this is not something uh, discretionary. It's not something that Hong Kong can decide to do or not to do because it is so important now uh, for China uh, under this whole nation approach that Hong Kong, Macau have to be fully integrated into the national development path. And uh, closer to Hong Kong, of course, uh, the importance of uh, uh, playing a more active part in the, great, uh, in the greater Bay Area and closer collaboration between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And then within Hong Kong, the central government uh, has uh, make it even more important that Hong Kong must solve its fundamental uh, contradictions in society, livelihood issues, housing, and so forth. But uh, at the moment, I think the political transition uh, seems to be uh, more pertinent. So what next? Uh, unavoidably, uh, there are all kinds of uh, doomsday thesis or near doomsday thesis, uh, pessimism. But I think we have to reflect on the past journey of one country to systems, that this journey has never been uh, regarded as straightforward from day one, because we are talking about uh, bring two rather opposing uh, systems or existentialism together. We're trying to make the, uh, the possible out of the impossible. And, and, and Hong Kong cannot be uh, a self-standing Hong Kong. Hong Kong is part of China. Hong Kong's future is part of uh, China's future. So the SAL unavoidably would be constrained and shaped by China's evolving reality. But the outcome is not fully predetermined because uh, China is evolving. So in a way, China is also steering uh, the possible out of the impossible, so to speak, because of, uh, uh, it, if you look at China today compared to China 30 years ago or 40 years ago, there's been a lot of changes. So similarly, I think uh, we should be open to uh, all kinds of uh, possibilities uh, in the future. And this is how history goes. And what Hong Kong can do and should do to sustain vibrancy and resilience in practical circumstances, I think that is the main challenge uh, to Hong Kong. And if Hong Kong cannot demonstrate is comparative advantage. And if that comparative advantage, if there is such advantage, 
cannot be regarded as a value to the nation. If Hong Kong is considered or perceived on the mainland as being a threat to the nation, then of course, uh, the basis for Hong Kong's special status for Hong Kong's exceptionalism uh, will not be firm. So I think that that is the main challenge uh, for Hong Kong now in the next stage of one country, two systems. The, there are no alternative uh, future for Hong Kong uh, to one country, one country, two systems, because conceptually you either have one country, one system, or Hong Kong becoming uh, totally separate from the mainland. I don't think that those two are the real options for Hong Kong people right now. So the, the, the only option is to make the best out of one country, two systems, and to deal with the tensions between the two existentialisms. Uh, we'll be putting one country, two systems, uh, need to find a new footing in the ever-changing context. And we have to think beyond 2047, because uh, although the basic law has guaranteed no change, continuity of Hong Kong's pre-existing system for 50 years, I think we should be looking beyond 2047. We should be uh, considering how to make Hong Kong work within part of China, within China, and therefore Hong Kong continues to contribute uh, to national development. Hong Kong continues to demonstrate its comparative advantage, and therefore uh, there is everything to gain for all sides out of one country to systems. Now this slide. Uh, tries to compare the doomsday view versus the positive view. The doomsday view uh, takes things to the very extreme, in my view, that Hong Kong is already into one country, one system. I mean, that is what Donald Trump said uh, uh, last year, uh, that the CPG no longer trusts Hong Kong people, that Hong Kong is becoming a national security city with weakened judiciary that Hong Kong gradually has ceased to be an international hub, that uh, the system is collapsing, uh, that Hong Kong has become secondary to Shenzhen, and so on and so forth. I think these are all very fatalistic views of Hong Kong. The reality is less pessimistic. Of course, there are uncertainties, but uncertainties can turn into possibilities. Hong Kong is still in one country, two systems, maybe 2.0 version, 2 version. Hong Kong has to settle as a special administrative region within a, uh, the CCP-led uh, party state system. Conditional trust can, build, can still be built if there is better mutual understanding of opportunities and limitations. That China still values Hong Kong's relative difference, but was on the basis that Hong Kong doesn't uh, cross the red lines, The Hong Kong uh, is clear about the importance of national interest. But there is a paradox. Now, Hong Kong cannot just uh, take advantage of uh, is, uh, what, it, what it can get out of the country under the notion of internal circulation. If that is what Hong Kong can do, then of course Hong Kong doesn't have uh, enough uh, special advantage. Hong Kong must at the same time connect to the world. And from the international perspective, why Hong Kong is important is Hong Kong is part of China and yet Hong Kong has its very special features. So this paradox will continue and Hong Kong has to excel under this paradox. Regarding Shenzhen uh, or Shanghai for that purpose, I think Hong Kong still enjoys special uh, advantage under the basic law. There are things that can be done in Hong Kong, but not necessarily in Shenzhen or Shanghai. But anyway, Hong Kong has to uh, demonstrate that such special uh, features under the basic law can really enable Hong Kong to contribute to the nation, to enable Hong Kong to be prominent. So Hong Kong has to learn to assert its voice and visibility within the nation. 
Right now, of course, politically, we can see all kinds of changes. The full implications of those changes have yet to be uh, assessed, but there's no, not yet a breakdown per se of Hong Kong's civil society and institutions. There are concerns, there are worries, but I think uh, we still have the opportunity to make the best out of uh, the current situation. So I, I would not subscribe to a doomsday view. I think uh, there is a possibility to work out a more positive uh, outcome. But right now, of course, we, we face various challenges and therefore we have to be quite realistic about those challenges. And we have to start from the current situation in order to reboot one country to systems. So I think I've uh, used up all my time, maybe I've over, a little bit of overrun, but I hope I will be able to uh, answer some of your questions uh, later on in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jern, for this very excellent uh, evaluation uh, and examination of the current status uh, of the one country, two system. May I now invite Professor Liu um, to continue uh, with his presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Suyo. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be able to join this um, uh, webinar um, and like what's been um, introduced by Suyo. It's, uh, it's a very important topic. Um, it's probably the most important topic um, in Hong Kong nowadays and um, the diverse views. And I think the, the best way to move forward is, is to revive our discussion and, and, and explore uh, areas of um, further deliberation and um, critical reflections. And my approach to um, today's topic is um, I would kind of like to um, look at the way that we have been approaching um, the notion of one country, two systems. And I would like to start with, of course, the background. Um, a background, of course, has already been mentioned by Anthony and, and many uh, authors and writers uh, on the topic of one country, two system. Um, and that is basically, it was a historical compromise that we have to put it back into the um, historical context of 1980s when the question of Hong Kong's future emerged. And we have to recognize that at that period of time, of course, probably the same uh, nowadays, is that there were diverse interests. Um, there were different concerns and different kinds of worries and expectations. And one country, two system is a framework trying to accommodate these diverse interests. And just to mention perhaps the two main concerns in the 1980s, of course, is on the side of China, um, the important questions is how to uphold national and territorial um, integrity, um, but allowing for um, the existence of a capitalist economy within his own socialist system. Um, of course, nowadays, after seeing China going through marketization, we would tend to think that that's a that's an easy issue to, to, to deal with. But again, if you put it back into the 1980s, um, it's a challenge for, for, for Beijing as well. Um, but they look at it at that time, of course, uh, the issue of primary importance would be upholding national and territorial integrity and uh, Hong Kong's future has to be settled and there should be an end to the unequal treaties and, and, and so on and so forth. And they compromise in the sense that of saying, okay, we, we would allow for um, a, a different kind of socioeconomic system, um, even though that is within uh, the same um, sovereign state. On the side of Hong Kong, of course, there were a lot of fears of socialist authoritarianism, uh, partly because a lot of people of Hong Kong with a migrant background, they came from China as refugees, as migrants, some of them legal migrants, some of them illegal migrants, um, even though that they are not arrivals in the early 
1950s, um, many came later on, but they have experienced political campaigns in the mainland. So they, they do have concerns, they do have worries. Uh, at that point of time in the 80s, of course, many of them would fear that uh, if Hong Kong would return to China in 1997, that would be going back to square one. I mean, the whole reason for them to leave is to try to keep a distance and then now they need to come go back to China. Uh, but of course, um, the promise of maintaining market capitalism, the rule of law, personal freedom, um, this sort of helped to pacify their fears and at least um, there would be sort of institutional arrangement to safeguard the basic concerns um, of a lot of the Hong Kong people at that time. Uh, but then of course, this is also a compromise in the sense that um, um, during the diplomatic talks of Hong Kong's future, uh, it is confirmed that uh, Hong Kong will return to China on the 1st of July, 1997. Um, so because it, is, it was a compromise, so it, it literally means that each of the concerned parties, I mean, different interests, different groups, of course, it's more complicated than what I've just described, um, but each of them would be able to take something from this compromise. But at the same time, because it was a compromise, it also meant that um, not a single party would be able to get what they want. Meaning that, you know, uh, everyone, of course, in the back of their mind have a full package of what would be the ideal arrangement for them. Uh, but because of a compromise, you have, to, you have to get something and then you have to give up something. You have to, have to accept the fact that not everyone would, would take your ideas on board. Um, so that is, you know, the kind of basic conditions of a compromise. And because of that, and because of the need to make a compromise, the need to, to accommodate diverse interests, I tend to see that you know one country, two system necessarily has some loose ends. There are issues that, quite frankly, um, not directly confronting them. Um, you, you work out a kind of way that so that everyone seems to be happy, but at the same time, um, some of your worries would, would continue to, to exist. Um, you would have situation where you get some extent of what you expected, but not exactly the full package, and so on and so forth. And because of the existence of these loose ends, um, I tend to think that, you know, um, for concerned party to assume that uh, basically by the first day of July 1997 is mission accomplished. Um, so it, the job is done. And so um, this is one country, two system. I tend to think that that's his wrong perspective um, because inevitably, partly because it was a historical compromise, partly because one country, two system itself is an evolving process. Um, things would continue. Partly because it, we, we have a changing context. The socioeconomic environment changed. Anthony mentioned about um, the, the sort of um, dynamics of um, economic influence between uh, mainland and Hong Kong. Uh, later on, Henry, of course, would mention a lot about uh, regional integration and, 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 and so on. So I won't go into it, but definitely we have, we have, we have felt uh, how the bigger economic environment, the bigger economic context uh, have big an impact um, on one country, two system, as simple as the flow of capital, the flow of people across border and so on and so forth. But more importantly, of course, would be the international context. And in hindsight, I must say that um, I think 99% of us um, actually have hugely underestimated the impact of the changing international, international political context. Um, the existing um, rivalry between United States and, and, and China, and of course also uh, contradictions and, and tensions 
between Europe and China, all these sort of changing configuration of international politics definitely have an impact on one country, two system as well. And in the context of, in, in the situation of all these changing contexts, political and socioeconomic, definitely this will bring about emerging challenges, challenges concerning uh, how smoothly can we conduct uh, regional integration, emerging challenges concerning uh, how we would reposition Hong Kong in a new context of international politics. Because in the old days, when we talk about international and global, uh, we quite honestly, we just treat international and global as an adjective that you don't really need to look into the details, but definitely now uh, is, a, is a very, very different ball game. And all these issues, of course, also go back to the loose ends that I, I've mentioned. For example, there were tensions inherent in the design. In our basic law, of course, we have a lot of articles trying to address the central government SAR relations. But at the same time, again, there were loose ends. We talk a lot about how the central government cannot tax us, how we will be able to keep our own fiscal policy, our own reserve, and, 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 and so on and so forth. We talk a lot about uh, representatives from different provinces have to obtain permission before setting up their companies or, or, or offices in, in, in Hong Kong, et cetera, et cetera. But we haven't really have one single article setting out very, very clearly about how the connection between central government and SAR government would, would be carried out. Um, of course, on the side of Beijing is, is rather obvious because um, all the powers of, 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 of the basic law, all these arrangements of one country, two system came from China's own constitution. Uh, it has to be part of the uh, country. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have been talking about autonomy, um, how we would be able to operationalize one country, two system in a way that we would uh, really fulfill the expectation of high autonomy um, and so on. But we also understand that by higher autonomy, we are talking about relative autonomy. It is not exactly that, you know, you're absolutely fully autonomous. So how relative? Um, and in what area? Um, for example, Anthony mentioned about we retained our own identity to participate in international affairs, in international sports and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, um, you would be able to do the same in, in diplomacy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, there are implications that we need to look into uh, these sort of issues. Um, and then of course, um, this loose ends increasingly um, becoming sources of tension and challenges. Um, and in the context of Hong Kong's own development, of course, if you look back at the basic law, um, there were two obvious institutional gaps unfixed at the time of its uh, promulgation. Um, on the one side, there would be the question about the pace of democratization. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate in the sense that um, the question of democratization gradually evolved to the extent that you know it was being phrased as whether you have or you would not have democratization, and not exactly addressing the question of the pace of it. You know how fast, at what stage, um, in what sort of pathways, and 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 so on, so that you know it would be a lot easier to to work out a, a compromise. At the same time, of course, Article Twenty Three was there. And the issue of national security, uh, honestly, simply cannot be assumed um, to, to be unproblematic. Uh, but how to work on it, how to actually be able to deal with it. Um, this, I would say, institutional gaps or the loose ends um, by themselves create. Um, differences in terms of perspective, perspectives and also uh, because of 
diverse interests or, and, and parties of different concerns, inevitably, uh, there will be different priorities as well. Um, but putting it in the context of Hong Kong, of course, the challenge is how to strike a balance. Um, inevitably, um, Beijing probably would think that you know, national security is a very important issue. And in the current context, of course, definitely it would be even more uh, important than uh, in the previous period. Uh, but how are we going to accommodate that? How are we going to work it out? That would be uh, the challenge in, in, in front of us. Um, and in working out all these perspectives and priorities, and when we are thinking about how to strike a balance, um, inevitably that we have to encounter the questions about parameters. Um, it would be non, rather naive to assume that, you know, um, when we talk about high autonomy, when we talk about issues of democratization, when we talk about issues about central government and SAL government's relations, um, we don't need to touch on uh, parameters. And in fact, if you go back to the first slide when I talk about historical compromise, uh, so when we conceive one country, two system, right from the very beginning is, is about parameters, is about how to work out a, a framework so that you know, we would be able to strike the balance. Um, but then the question is how to understand these parameters and also how to deal with them. And I tend to think that you know, for a long period of time, um, Hong Kong and Beijing tend to talk past each other each have his own language and each have his own agenda and assuming that, you know, by just talking that the other counterpart would take it up. Um, so um, in hindsight, again, um, I would say that, you know, the rather casual approach to the 2014 white paper issued by Beijing um, in hindsight is actually quite unbelievable. Um, a lot of the things that described in the um, uh, 2014 white paper, you cannot say that, you know, they were all new in, in the year of 2014. Um, they were just being inserted in post on, 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 on Hong Kong, which is not true. I, I mean, if you, if you look back then, you, you find same concepts, same expressions actually came out in different speeches uh, by Beijing leaders and, and top officials, legal experts, not just once, but uh, repeatedly. But then of course, all these ideas were, were never operationalized, never go down to the details and make them very concrete and, 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 and so on. And at the same time, you know, uh, Hong Kong has never tried to work out actually how should we look at these sort of messages and, and how should we understand um, the sort of parameters uh, being spelled out and, and how would you interpret uh, how to deal with them. Um, would you confront these parameters with restraint so that you would know that you know, there are areas that you would stay away from or, or there would be areas that you say that you are more ready to accommodate and, and, and accept compromise or rather, well, this is you know, a, a kind of ABC in, 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 in political mobilization is, there's always one school of thought that thinking that, you know, what you should do is to confront and stretch it to the very limits so that you would expose all this inherent contradiction and, and so on. And what would happen later on, who knows, but you just push it as much as you can. Uh, of course, you would need to face the consequence. But definitely this sort of issue, this sort of issue, you may say that these are issues of strategy, again, have never been fully addressed. What happened, of course, is what happened in the past two years. Um, my own personal interpretation is the political path pathway that has been practiced and sort of established since the pronouncement of the basic law in 1990 literally came to an end. Of course, that doesn't mean that that's the end of one country, two system, but rather that, you know, this is definitely a restart. This is just like what you're playing an electronic game of saying, okay, game over, you start it again. 
and we define the parameters. Questions like uh, you, you need to be patriotic in order to participate in the political elections and, 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 and so on and so forth. These are all elements of a new set of uh, parameters. Some of these elements in the new parameters, they are always with us. Issues about complete jurisdiction, issues about Hong Kong definitely belonging to part of China. Um, there are red lines. Actually, you know, people were aware of it in, in the year 1997. But then, of course, some of these new elements, they were not without at the very beginning. And so um, my question is, is there room for restarting? And then, of course, it has already been restarted. But rather go back to our basic law, rather go back to our the very beginning of the discussion of one country, two system, is there was a certain respect of the Hong Kong way of life. There's a certain respect of the Hong Kong way of operation because it, it was functional, because it would, would be contributive not only to Hong Kong's development, but also to China's development. We need to look at that, especially for those so-called new elements that doesn't quite fit in with Hong Kong way of life. But in order to do that, I think the major challenge in front of us is that, you know, can also Hong Kong also prove that the Hong Kong way is still valuable? Because we just can't say that, you know, you've got to do it in the Hong Kong way because this is Hong Kong. We need to, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to, to defend our, 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 our request and, and to defend our own position. And one way to defend it is, you know, we need to prove that, you know, it is actually important and it is actually valuable. And this includes to what extent would the Hong Kong way be compat compatible with the good law practice and expectations, but at the same time, it won't compromise national security concerns. That is, Hong Kong should really be as open as possible. It really should allow for a lot of exceptions. But these exceptions would not imply challenges to national security concerns. But what would they be? What are they? What are the limits? What are the restraints that we need to be aware of? And also, we need to spell out in what ways it is important to uphold the Hong Kong way in order to make Hong Kong SAR global. Because foreign investment can do business in, in, in Shanghai without having two systems. Things can continue to be conducted um, in terms of business and, and, and so on um, in the mainland. I mean, we, we need to be frank to our own self, you know, um, Hong Kong is not the only place within China to be able to, to be global or globally connected. But there's a special implications of maintaining Hong Kong global because it is particularly important to make it as not only part of China, but also part of the global economy, part of global system as well. And so that the interface would be smooth and seamless. Equally important, of course, would be um, the questions about how global does SAR want to be? Is it really ready to continue to play that role? Uh, for a long time, as I said, you know, when we use the term international or global in Hong Kong, we just take it as if, you know, it's unproblematic, but in the context of recent interna international po political changes, we've got to prepare ourselves, you know, what exactly do you mean by, by global and, and how global you, you, you're ready to be. A footnote to my discussion here, of course, is that, you know, when both Hong Kong and Beijing look at Hong Kong's global status, it is important to look at it not only in, in the present context, but also to think about how to prepare for Hong Kong and China in future. 
the same as Hong Kong in the old days. Hong Kong was an important window to China, not only because it was in the context of the old Cold War, but also in the context of changing international relations. When China's re-entered the world, when they launched economic reform in 1978, then you would see the value of Hong Kong because you would have a very important platform that allow you to go right away into the new strategic position. So to evaluate the extent of globalness of, of, of the Hong Kong SDR, we need to look at it not only in the present environment, but also to prepare for changing content for its, for its new functions to be emerged in a very different um, situation. And this is exactly the last statement that I would like to raise is how to show it to Beijing that it is important for Hong Kong to maintain its Hong Kong way and outlook. That is Hong Kong, when we say that, you know, it should be as free as possible. So what do you mean by that? And what is the value of that sort of outlook? What would be the importance of say, seriously upholding academic freedom, seriously upholding uh, freedom expression of opinion, all these things would be important to allow Hong Kong to continue to assume its own global profile and now look in the face of the international community. And all this I think is important in the sense that, as I said, is an involving process. So that requires a lot of input from Hong Kong itself to make this possible. Um, to conclude my presentation, one of the messages that I want to get across is that instead of blaming each other, saying that, you know, if you didn't do this to me, that I would have a lot better, uh, so that what's gone wrong is because you have done it wrong. Um, in fact, I think in order to make one country, two system doable, it requires all these concerned interests and parties to be positively involved in, 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 in make it, making it a viable project, a vibrant project, and a project with a promising future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lu, for raising so many, so many important questions for us to consider. Um, so now we will speak to the last presentation uh, by Dr. Henry Ho, who is joining us from Beijing today. So uh, Dr. Ho, are you? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Anthony and Dialogue to invite me to share with you on this topic. Um, this morning, I choose to uh, uh, a little bit focused on uh, some of the key issues I think uh, relates to, you know, what has happened in the past two decades and which is differentiation versus integration. And I think uh, the way we handle this dialectic relationship uh, can explain a lot of issues or problems that occurred in the past. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. And today, I uh, roughly introduced the think tank that I'm working on, uh, One Country, Two Systems, Two Forum. And then uh, we'll go to some common perceptions and misconceptions. And I would like to put forward some of my arguments about social, economic, and political integration. And finally, is there a common ground or formula for the way forward? Next, please. Well, um, the think tank, One Country, Two Systems, Youth Forum, uh, is composed of young scholars, professionals, and politicians from Hong Kong and the mainland and founded in 2017. We hope to integrate the perspectives of young people from both sides of the border to conduct research and dialogue. And we believe that the volatility of OCTS should be co-created by young people in Hong Kong and the mainland. And of course, we believe it is still the best institutional choice for the future development of mainland and Hong Kong. Next, please. Well, well, a little bit background of myself. I worked in the government before, uh, both as a political assistant and a full-time researcher and part-time member of Central Policy Unit. Uh, worked at Hong Kong PRI as well. And uh, currently, I'm the uh, council member of the Chiang uh, Kai Wing and also the Basic Law Promotion Commi uh, Steering Committee. And my research interest is uh, 
when computer systems and basic law, creative area, Hong Kong governance, etc. And um, I was graduated in Chinese youth sociology and uh, LSD and also uh, Doctor of Laws at Peking University. Next, please. Okay, let me come to some common perceptions and misconceptions. I think these uh, perceptions are still pre uh, prevalent among Hong Kong people. Uh, first of all, uh, prosperity and stability of Hong Kong is the key goal of one country, two systems. Of course, you know, as someone brought me Hong Kong, uh, it is very familiar uh, for people in particular be before the reunification to specify that, you know, we need to keep prosperity and stability for 50 years for Hong Kong. This is important, but I think this is secondary to the overriding national interest or national goals. We know that uh, uh, China at, uh, during 1980s, uh, uh, which uh, it has just started the uh, reform and opening up process, uh, wants to, um, wanted to uh, resolve these uh, territorial disputes through a peaceful way. That's why we have signed the British Declaration and also the basic law. But I think uh, all along, the national interests are still primary. And in recent years, uh, we're talking about sovereignty, safety, and development interest. And what we call 50 years unchanged refers to the original capitalist system, which I think the mainland and Hong Kong have very different understanding. Uh, from the mainland or central government uh, perspective, it's basically economic. But as we all know, during the transitional period before 1997, you know, most of discussion uh, was about universal suffrage, the pace and the, and, and the composition and the format. But I think uh, in this, from the central uh, government point of view, economic is, is the first uh, overriding consideration. The second, I think, common perception is that Hong Kong is the model of Taiwan for reunification. That's why many people, uh, either from Hong Kong or from the international community, would think that in order to uh, attract Taiwan to, 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 to be reunificated, uh, there will be a lot of uh, soft approach towards Hong Kong. But to me, I think, as I'm reflecting this over the years, I think OCTS means the Special Administrative Region practices a different system from the motherland. So it, the key is a different system. But we can see Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan are very different on its own. Look at this, the uh, system in Hong Kong and Macau, and we could see that uh, for the past two decades, the development paths are very different. So uh, for me, I think this model of Taiwan is maybe a, an oversimplified uh, uh, concept for how we understand uh, one country, two systems. Next, please. And I think the third probably misconception is that Hong Kong is a counterpart or an equal in negotiating party with central government. Um, I think Dialogue has just mentioned about uh, the central leaders talking about the relationship. And I quoted, I quote here, back in 2007, uh, Wu Bangguo, which was the um, uh, MPC chairman at that time, uh, during the 10th uh, anniversary of the Hong Kong SAR, said clearly that China is a unitary state and Hong Kong has no residual power. And I think uh, I've been in both mainland and Hong Kong for many years. To me, I think this is the common sense for mainland officials and academics. Yet, uh, the Hong Kong uh, was only realized after the 2014 White Paper. So we have one hand, Hong Kong people guaranteed, you know, uh, 50 years unchanged, uh, stability, prosperity, uh, freedom, etc. But on the other hand, uh, from the central government point of view, there's a change of consti constitutional order. The change of constitutional order matters more than the, what we call the preservation of uh, a lifestyle for 50 years. So that's why uh, back in 2007, you know, uh, top Chinese leaders have or had already indicated that there's no residual power for Hong Kong. And so this kind of uh, mentality, I think, leads to some uh, some propositions in the past. For example, you know, Hong Kong people would like 
universal suffrage to be ASAP, and the central government would like Article 23 to be implemented ASAP. So one have an exchange or a consultation in tandem. I think many people, including Zhang Yuxin, you know, proposed that like two or three years ago. So the assumption is that, you know, we are an equal, equal negotiating party with central government. There can be a trade or kind of an exchange, but obviously I think uh, this may be uh, 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 a, uh, an inaccurate, you know, perception. The fourth uh, perception I think is also quite uh, popular among Hong Kong people. Uh, uh, many Hong Kong people think that democracy or the universal suffrage is a basic right which CPG owes to Hong Kong. And this is my own term, Po Xun Him Jai Long. The people thinking that, you know, since 1980s, you know, Hong Kong people should have universal suffrage, but CPG tends to procrastinate it for various reasons. And this is this kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding, I think also explains a lot of problems in the past. But of course, I think to the central government, Political and electoral systems are always a means to an end. And uh, we should be mindful that Hong Kong is the only place in China to be allowed universal suffrage. And more importantly, if you look at our basic law compared to the constitutional documents around the world, I think basic law is a very rare document specifying the change of uh, electoral systems, you know, with a final goal, but with our timetable. So, to me, I think this is always a, a compromise or th the responsibility lies within uh, central government, uh, Hong Kong people, and, and also the LegCo. So, but the problem is this kind of, uh, uh, what, what do we call it, owing theory, you know, explains why we have occupation central, explains why we have so-called genuine universal suffrage. So this is something I think, uh, uh, we need to be uh, careful about. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, talking about uh, differentiation and integration. Uh, I think at the uh, very beginning uh, of the of the of the re reunification, uh, I used the word "gokti right then. Each governing its own territory. You know, it seems to be a negative word, but I think at least in the first five or ten years uh, after nineteen ninety seven. This, is some, this seems to be a good thing. Uh, we are talking about well water and river water not flowing, you know, towards one another. And also we, we know that Hong Kong's responses towards integration with Shenzhen and Mengle are really lukewarm. Uh, notably, you know, former Chief Secretary Anson Chan, you know, widely known to be uh, uninterested in talking about integration with Shenzhen, in talking about uh, bridge between Hong Kong, Zhuhai, and Shenzhen. But we can see economic and political uh, integration uh, has been taking place. First of all, after 2003, we have the uh, CPG sees the need to support Hong Kong through export of tourists and visitors. And also uh, in 2007, there's a decision by MPC uh, that there's a committed universal suffrage, but in a steady and controlled manner. Next, please. Yet, we have seen integration in all fronts. Uh, some are non-policy driven, such as cross-border families. I think we have more than half a million cross-border families in Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, we may have like one in, one in five or six families, including you know, a cross-border partner. Some are policy driven, such as we have uh, a lot of mainland students in Hong Kong, and more and more Hong Kong students studying in mainland. Well, I think there have been long held beliefs that uh, we can have economic and social integration without political integration. So is it possible? Or is it exactly the source of the problem? So here I, I come with my hypothesis that perhaps the different pace of social, economic and political integration leads to the worsening relationship between Hong Kong and the mainland in the past years. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talk about integration, uh, we understand that it has been a sensitive word in the mainland until 2017. Uh, before it was conceived to be not respecting one country's systems, but uh, in that 2017, the 19th plenary session of 
Communist Party of China. Since then, we are talking more about uh, integrating with the nation, have become the key thing. So this kind of sensitive word has become a keyword. And of course, integration presumes differences. Otherwise, we, we don't need to talk about integration if Hong Kong is exactly the same as the mainland. So the key questions may be, who is integrating with whom? And what are the key differences that need to be preserved? Next, please. Okay, so here I, I try to summarize what has happened uh, for economic and social integration. First of all, uh, this we all know, uh, economic integration started from 1990s. Uh, I can summarize it uh, into northbound and southbound. For northbound, um, the capital and management techniques of Hong Kong, uh, from manufacturing industry to service industry, transferred from Hong Kong to PLD, actually marks the reform and opening up process of mainly China. And uh, I think Xi Jinping in 2018, uh, when celebrating the 40th uh, anniversary of reform and opening up policy, in particular stressed the importance of Hong Kong contribution to this process. And we know uh, after 2003, we have SIPA, which uh, some professionals are moving north. And this contributed to the maintenance development in the past decades. But of course, what is uh, significant in the past few years is the southbound kind of integration. Uh, we have state-owned enterprises entering the international market through Hong Kong's platform, uh, financial markets, bond markets, uh, stock markets, etc. We have individual visa scheme, Jiao uh, which has boosted the Hong Kong's economy, in particular between 2003 and 2010. But I think in the same time, slow down our, our economic transformation. And we have talents from mainland and overseas bringing competition to Hong Kong. Next slide. And recent trends, we see enterprises from the mainland have entered more and more industries in Hong Kong from retail industry to energy and real estate industry. And we have some significant presence of some big groups, uh, notably HNA, Haihang Group, and Evergrande Group. You know, both have been very big, but now experiencing different kinds of problems. So though if, if in five years ago, 10 years ago, we, we are talking, we talking about a problem of a mainland property company, such as Evergrande, it only hits uh, China economic news. But now we know that the problem of Evergrande Group has affected to some home buyers in Hong Kong and uh, Hong Kong banks uh, are not give, a lot, uh, approving, uh, giving mortgages for those home buyers. So this kind of integration, uh, kind of, I think, incredible, like 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Next. For social integration, uh, uh, I mean, the people moving north, you know, the composition uh, is very different. Before, I think mainly the privileged class moved to the north, uh, moved to mainland China, such as multinational enterprise, top management, local enterprises and merchants and professionals. But in recent years, we are talking about middle managers, retirees uh, trying to have retirement in uh, GBA, undergraduates, young people. So there are growing demands of health, education, housing, these sorts of uh, welfare provisions. And that's why uh, people complained a few years ago that with our mainland ID card, they can't enjoy a lot of e-services, um, e-commerce or e-government services. And in recent years, we're talking about eco-treatments or how Hong Kong people could integrate into the mainland better. Next. And so we have central government introducing a lot of measures uh, and policies to support Hong Kong residents in the mainland, such as uh, uh, no working permits required, uh, the granting of a residence permit with a 18 digit document similar to the mainland ID, uh, opening of housing markets, uh, allow the purchase of social security insurance, etc. So these kind of uh, uh, problems or questions, you know, uh, for people, you know, uh, working in Beijing 20 years ago, it's a very different uh, concept. Those working in the Beijing 20 years ago, they would never think of going into a 
mainland local hospital, uh, they would they would go to those international clinics uh, for anything uh, serious. They would go back to Hong Kong. But as the social integration uh, process, this is very different. So the key, one of the key problems is, you know, Hong Kong uh, people, you know, we have different labels all along. Hong Kong residents, Hong Kong government, and then a compatriot in Hong Kong, you know, we have these kinds of labels before, but how during the integration process, how could we, you know, um, uh, uh, go into other identities such as Chinese citizens with clear defined rights and obligations? These are some of the issues that we need to think about. Next slide, please. So of course, there's some unsolved problems uh, for social integration. For example, how does our government adjust its policy vision? Take cross-border welfare, for example. Some have more and more uh, elderly people uh, retiring in Guangdong. So how portable, how portable are our benefits? Well, now we have a Guangdong or Fujian scheme where people are uh, relying on uh, OH allowance. They, they, can, um, they can still receive them in the mainland. Um, but how about the more important medical services? How about, you know, can the, can the elderly home uh, benefits uh, for young people enjoying Hong Kong, can they also, are uh, these benefits still portable? Can Hong Kong government subsidize some of the uh, elderly homes in greater Bay Area? And, and in one word, should our welfare be provided based on identity or location or both? So we're talking about greater Bay Area, but in most cases, Hong Kong government would require Hong Kong PR uh, stay in Hong Kong in order to be eligible for so many benefits. So these are the questions that we need to think about. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, a small summary for this part. Uh, I think the economic integration was led by mainly by market mechanisms supported by national policies and the key eight words, which I think Anthony has also mentioned earlier on is uh, how to leverage Hong Kong's advantages uh, to contribute to make the country. Well, social integration, as I've mentioned, I think it's mainly led by the national policies and trying to provide an equal or sometimes special treatments and encouraging Hong Kong residents to integrate into mainland. So from this perspective, I think greater Bay area can be viewed as a further economic and social integration between Hong Kong and the mainland. So the remaining problem is how to facilitate political integration. Next. So uh, I think it's the key to the success of one country, two systems. Uh, if you believe in Marx's theory, po uh, politics, uh, political structure is something of a superstructure. And when economic relations change, political relations could not remain unchanged. But the problem is while we are having more and more integrating relationship between uh, Hong Kong and mainland on the economic and social perspective, for the change of political structure, we are talking about uh, universal suffrage, which is the system uh, uh, deviated uh, from the mainland you know, socialist system. You know, is it going to work? So I think political integration is necessary. We're not talking about abandoning OCTS or high degree of autonomy, but at least it requires some stronger sense of identity and similar values between Hong Kong and the mainland. Otherwise, social and economic integration may not be able to further proceed. And from this, I think there are two aspects we need to, uh, I want to discuss. One is the government aspect and the other is the Hong Kong citizens. Next, please. Okay. Uh, the first question I'm thinking is, are government officials ready for integration of the mainland? Um, from what I understand, I think the civil servants of Hong Kong, most of them brought up in Hong Kong, uh, enter the civil service right after the graduation. It seems to be both uh, not very capable and reluctant to work with many officials. And I think this is also one of the key issues. Uh, we have all the high level meetings between um, 
between principal officials and the mainland, but how to implement? How about the departmental level? You know, are they prepared to work with the GBA counterparts on all sorts of infrastructure, environmental protection, policies, etc.? I think I think I have questions about that. And secondly, uh, we're talking about five-year plan, which is a hit topic uh, in recent months. But in Hong Kong, it follows more about chief executive's five-year term instead of China's five-year plan. And both are, both are non-overlapping. So before we see a lot of talk in five-year plan, in seminars, in newspapers, but after the heat, you know, you know people uh, forgot everything and then working on Hong Kong's own initiatives. Uh, we see some changes in the latest policy addressed by Carrie Lam, you know, saying how we, how, how we should be following the five-year plan uh, uh, so that there will be more uh, policy continuity in Hong Kong. Uh, next, please. Next, yes. Uh, of course, we see Hong Kong citizens resistant to political integration. Um, uh, as we all know, you know, Hong Kong people's identity has been defined by its differences with the mainland China, and uh, and some of some some also relates to the failure of our government to to implement effective measures to kind of mitigate the negative impacts of you know overwhelming mainland visitors in the past few years, and of course, there's a lack of trust and respect you know, uh, between the both sides and resulting in what I call the extreme right ideology, you know, uh, kind of blaming central government, mainland citizens and Chinese companies for all Hong Kong's problems. Next, please. Okay, so uh, after the national security law and new electoral system, we have seen a redefining relationship between Hong Kong and the mainland. So, uh, today's topic is about reboot, right? Uh, uh, instead of reboot, uh, but I think uh, redefining maybe a maybe a, a maybe a better word. Uh, we have seen the central government kind of end of tolerance towards opposition camps. Um, I would like to talk. About, uh, many people talk about 2014, 2019, 2017. I like to talk about 2016. Uh, in May that year. Uh, Zhang Dejiang, the uh, before the uh, national, uh, the MPC cha uh, uh, chairman, uh, came to Hong Kong. If you remember, he uh, Zhang Dejiang came to Hong Kong to meet four or five uh, pan-democratic politicians, including Emily Lau, um, Alan Leung, etc. And that was after the veto of political reforms, and even after the Mong Kok riots. So, from my point of view, you know, CBG, you know. Uh, kind of has been kind of accommodating or tolerating many of Hong Kong's turmoil in the past years. And, and I don't think uh, it has really uh, adopted a high-handed approach right from the beginning. But of course, in 2019, we see many of the tolerance, you know, are no longer uh, available. And the new electoral system, I think, serves to remove the aspirations or the myth of universal suffrage altogether. At the very beginning, I said uh, many people who in Hong Kong think uh, CPG owes them a universal suffrage. This is something that needs to be repaid. But now the C CPG is saying that you know all political systems are a means to an end, and currently national security or patriots governing Hong Kong is the overriding principle. And so after these two you know, measures, the law and the new electoral system, I think Hong Kong government uh, or the central government will help Hong Kong government to focus on resolving economic and social problems. And I think the role of CPG on this you know, remains to be seen. We have seen the, um, the uh, head of uh, liaison office, the director of liaison office, going to a lot of uh, grassroots families to visit, you know, the frequency of which is even higher than many Hong Kong um, principal officials. So the role of CPG in helping or facilitate Hong Kong to solve 
its main economic and social problems, you know, remains to be seen. Next. Okay, to conclude, uh, I try to put some uh, uh, framework for discussion. Uh, to me, I think the essence of OCTS uh, can be summarized in one sentence. Hong Kong system is different, yet beneficial to China. So we need to remain to be different, but the goal is to be beneficial to China. So uh, conceptually, we can have a two, two times two matrix. Uh, so, and having four scenarios. Uh, scenario one being Hong Kong is identical to China and at the same time beneficial to China. Uh, in theory, it doesn't exist. Otherwise, we don't need one country, two systems, right? And the scenario two being when Hong Kong is identical, Hong Kong systems identical uh, to mainland China, it gives disbenefits or it overmines, it undermines the uh, mainland system. Uh, I think most of us would agree to that. Scenario four perhaps is the worst scenario. And, and this is what we have seen in 2014 to 2019, where Hong Kong people are striving for a very different system from mainland, but at the same time, uh, being harmful to, 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 to mainland, or as perceived as very harmful to, to, to national security. So CBG doesn't want scenario two to happen, and scenario three should be the best scenario, where we have a level of difference from mainland, while at the same time, uh, benefit to mainland. Next, please. So I would say that this the formula, uh, if you like, may be able to summarize a lot of the political conflicts in the past 20 years, which is to what extent should Hong Kong be different from mainland without damaging national interest? So take the two uh, notable examples, like universal suffrage. Hong Kong is the only place allowed to be practiced universal suffrage. This is a different system, but if, the, if the system design uh, uh, threatens national interest, then uh, there won't be a deal. So while we're talking about genuine universal suffrage, people should bear in mind that, you know, this is already a, a system very different from the mainland China, from the from socialist China. Uh, so um, if we insist on having such a large difference, you know, there won't be a deal. And the second example is the Article 23. We all know that every country in the world, uh, national security law uh, was enact, uh, are enacted by central government. Uh, it is just the difference, the system, the different systems in Hong Kong that central government allow Hong Kong government to legislate by its own legislation on Article 23. This is something different and, and also to, to, to respect Hong Kong people's way of life, respect Hong Kong people's views. But as this has not been done in more than 20 years, and as we have the rise in 2019, now this kind of uh, you know, different arrangements were perceived to be uh, seriously threatening national interests. And that's why we have NSL directly you know, enacted by the National uh, People's Congress also under the basic law. So to me, I think uh, Hong Kong has maintained a different system yet beneficial to China, maybe the greatest common denominator between mainland and Hong Kong, and the key to sustainability of one country, two systems through 2047 and beyond. Of course, this is easier than done. Uh, I can give a very, recent example like COVID. Uh, I've been uh, under quarantine, this is the third time uh, in mainland China. And I think I've seen the uh, differences, a huge difference between the mechanisms in mainland Hong Kong. Yet economic and social integration needs uh, requires Hong Kong government to make certain changes or accommodations. But for COVID, you know, for, 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 anti -vi uh, for virus, you know, combating measures, you know, uh, we know that one country two systems, but 
does one rule or one system work? In Hong Kong, we are talking about zero case as a condition preconditions. But after we have several zero case for like two months, people are talking about we need to have the same mechanism with China in uh, like an identical tracking, lockdown, and treating mechanisms. And that that gives a very difficult uh, question to, for Hong Kong people and the government. So uh, I'm sure the economic and social integration uh, speed uh, or the pace uh, will pick up uh, uh, in particular after the implementation of NSL and the new issue system. But if the political integration issue, at least we need to be to face that problem. If it is not tackled really uh, in an appropriate manner, the economic social integration uh, uh, pace of progress would have to be slowed down. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Um, so I I think since we have limited time, I will uh, combine the Q&A and the one table section. Um, so, um, well, first, let me kind of like summarize the you know, free presentation. I think uh, the free presentation both points to the source of com conflict or the challenges that we are facing today in the one country, two system framework, and also uh, highlight some important questions that we will have to think about uh, as we move forward. Uh, all three speakers agree that there are significant, there have been significant change to the system. Uh, if that is not a new game in Professor Louis' work, um, in since twenty nineteen, and so uh, I think everyone is very interested in you know well yeah as we move forward, what kind of strategies should we take? And uh, we have received three questions from the audience, and and I think the questions share one very, uh, basically very similar, um, is how how should we move forward? Um, so all three speakers highlight one important thing um, that we have to consider is, is, is that well, uh, as Hong Kong continue to move forward and think about the one country, two system under the one country, two system framework, it's important to, um, it's important to highlight the values of the differences that Hong Kong enjoy right now to, to, to the country. So uh, the values of Hong Kong's to the country, to national development. But I think uh, one reason that, uh, and including me myself, uh, that, I, that we would have is, uh, is how would this be possible? Are we actually facing a task in a mission impossible here? Uh, so that's why I think uh, uh, the audience also uh, have the questions like that. How could we really maximize the interest here? How could we really achieve that? Um, I would just highlight three potential contradiction that to me, I think is kind of like impossible um, to adjust. First is um, that we, on the one hand, Hong Kong would benefit national development, but at the same time maintain Hong Kong's international connections. It seems to me that, well, at least for the past few decades, Hong Kong's distinctiveness uh, or the values of that distinctiveness lies in international recognition that Hong Kong is different. From uh, from the mainland China, and that recognition is now fading uh, after twenty nineteen, right? Um, and the second question, the second contradiction that, or the second key challenge that I'm thinking of is, uh, as Doctor Ho mentioned, integration is now really going on, and and is something that we can avoid. But how? But but is actually as we look at you know. International examples, integration often come with uh, identity conflicts. Um, so how could that integration continue to happen without, you know, facing some serious identity identity conflict or the kind of, you know, sense of crisis of belongings uh, at the same time? And then finally, um, well, I, I, uh, for the three speakers, I don't think you have to address these contradiction uh, specifically, but uh, but yeah, I. I but, but let me also mention the last one first. Uh, the last challenge that I am thinking of is how could, uh, well, so after last year, we, we, we know that there is a electoral reform and now the ele election is kind of like um, very different from the previous years. Uh, how could the new electoral reforms uh, on the one hand uh, provide sufficient security to Beijing, but on the other hand, uh, ensure that politicians will continue and remain accountable to uh, the people in Hong Kong, the accountability issues. So, um, 
So, so again, uh, I don't think speakers need to uh, address these specific concerns, but uh, overall, my bigger question, and I think the audience will also ask this, are we facing a mission impossible uh, here? Thank you. Uh, maybe let me uh, try to address your, your uh, three questions. Are we uh, uh, going for a mission impossible? In a way, uh, from day one, uh, OCTS, one country, two systems, was somewhat like uh, a mission impossible because we are talking about uh, accommodating two rather opposing uh, ideological systems. And then, of course, the kind of existentialism uh, back in the 1980s actually was, uh, uh, were, were more uh, in conflict, if you like, compared to today. So it, it's always been a journey of uh, achieving uh, the possible out of the impossible. But at this point, I think uh, to be more pragmatic, we have to ask, do we have any consensus? And I think we have consensus. The first consensus is we are still for one country, two systems, for whatever reasons, for whatever interest. This, is, this seems to be a more uh, realistic option, a preferred option compared to the, to the other options. So the challenge is, how do we make one country, two systems work? And that depends on how do we interpret one country, two systems. And the second consensus, which is related to the first one, is we still think that Hong Kong should be different. We meaning from the Hong Kong side, we also uh, include the CPG and the mainland. I think if Hong Kong is not an different at all from any mainland city, I don't think the central government would value Hong Kong. So at least we can start uh, with uh, these two uh, so-called consensus points. Uh, between Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong in between China and the West, I think uh, that of course depends on the future of this macro geopolitical environment. Uh, right now there's real tension, there's rivalry between the US led Western camp and, and, and China. And I don't subscribe to the US view that China is not respecting uh, rules-based order. I think what China wants is to redefine the order. Uh, to, uh, and that order should not just be uh, defined by the West and the US. So it's a kind of uh, uh, we understanding uh, uh, still a rule-based uh, rules international order. Now, it, it may take time for uh, a realistic kind of uh, understanding of coexistence between the two camps or the two worlds uh, per se. But I think that may take time, but that will come. And of course, uh, uh, the better the relationship between the West and, and China, of course, Hong Kong can have a better role to play because uh, without this global dimension, I don't think Hong Kong could contribute more to the national interest. Integration has always been difficult because we are talking about uh, two existentialisms. Even in the, in the West, if you take the European Union for example, uh, EU has been talking about, have been practicing uh, integration for decades, and still there, has, there are still tensions, even within the similar civilization, uh, similar uh, institutional arrangements. So I will not underestimate the complication, the challenges for integration, but I think it depends on the mindset. If we are of a non-zero sum mindset, maybe it's easier to accommodate difference, to, to sort of uh, uh, to be more tolerant of, of uh, others. Uh, elections, yes, I think I agree with Henry that we are now in a new stage. Uh, but the basic law is still there. The universal suffrage objective is still there. But it depends on how you, how you define, how you practice universal suffrage. Even in the West, in the Western liberal democracy uh, system, uh, if you look at Germany, if you look at France, if you look at Australia, the kind of democracy could be quite different. In Asia, of course, Korea, Japan, or Singapore, Malaysia, so different. So uh, I think uh, maybe we should uh, uh, adopt a more open-minded approach to nurturing democracy. I think uh, 
definitely we have a setback because of what happened in 2019, but I don't think we should give up. Okay. Um, I, I probably look, try to address the first two questions. One is the international connection. Um, yeah, that's exactly the reason why I, I, I argue that, you know, we, we have to look at uh, the future of uh, one country, two system by preserving the Hong Kong way. Um, one of the way that we can con convince the two sides of um, the table is well, on one side is, of course, central government that, you know, you have to have confidence in us and, 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 and so on. And on the other side is to convince the international community that, you know, uh, we remain a very rational and open system here in Hong Kong. So we, we even if we carry out some of the national security measures, uh, we would continue to uphold it in, in, in the Hong Kong way. For example, I, I'm not particularly happy with the way that, you know, some of the um, 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 members of, of, of the uh, local councils or, or people intend to participate in, in election being disqualified in, 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 in its present format. I can accept the fact that you disqualify certain people but by looking at what he has done with obvious intent and obvious consequence, uh, but not by going back and, and, and check and then so that, you know, sorry about that, you know, not, not, you're not even able to apply for, for joining an open uh, uh, election. Um, I, I do think that we need to um, um, discuss with, 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 with Beijing about, you know, there would be measures, there would be way that, you know, we were able to ensure national security, but at the same time, you have to allow us to do things in, 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 in a, a way that, you know, we would meet also international expectations. Otherwise, we would not be able to up, upkeep uh, our image of being basically still a reasonably open society. Um, and so that's why I, I, I keep on saying that, you know, the, the Hong Kong way would be, would be important. Integration lead to identity conflict. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's not an easy issue to deal with, but at the same time, I think we need to learn from our own lesson uh, of what happened after 1997. One of the things is, what I was trying to point out in my presentation is that um, the way Hong Kong approach or probably at some stage Beijing as well of one country two system is that you know by first of July, nineteen ninety seven mission accomplished. You don't need to do anything. Just let it let it go. Um, good side is that you're hands off. The the best side is you allow for issues to 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 grow to the extent that you know gradually it's becoming difficult to manage. Uh, for example, if you look at what happened after 2003 is, okay, I, I, I give you millions of um, uh, tourists from mainland so that, you know, you would economically benefit from, from the process, which seems to be a, a, a sound argument. But at the same time, if you look at it from the Hong Kong perspective, it's a big, big issues about management. Uh, management, not only in the sense of how, how are you going to manage 50 million tourists by 2018? coming to Hong Kong, such a small place, how to cope with the congestion, how to satisfy the customers as well. You know, how would, would mainland tourists be happy uh, in that kind of context? At the same time, you know, if, if you allow tourism to expand to such an extent, uh, to be so reliant on, on, on inbound tourism, it actually have negative impact on, on economic restructuring, as mentioned by Henry. So these are some of the issues that we should have anticipation and, and management. Um, so the same thing about identity conflict. Uh, we need to go back to the root and say, is it an issues of emotional response to all this phenomena, or rather that it is something deep down in Hong Kong so that we, 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 we reject other people? Because in Hong Kong, at the end of the day, you need to look back in our own history. We have so much deep-rooted connections with China, mainland, um, most of our people actually have migrant backgrounds, so that's no ground. I mean, culturally, historically, to to reject mainland in this in this in this manner. So it it, it got to be something quite emotional. But why so emotional is because we never 
border to manage uh, the issue. So I, I do think that you know it, it is a difficult mission, but probably not impossible. Yes. Um, well, uh, I would also like to address these questions from my, you know, immature hypothesis, which is you know, the degree of political integration lags far behind social in and economic integration. So we have seen uh, previous efforts to to enhance political integration, the soft ways being national education, which has failed and try to have more Hong Kong young people going back to mainland China for uh, trips, etc. So it seems that the soft approaches won't work. And now we have the NSL and the new electoral system, and I would interpret it as a hard approach uh, in order to achieve political integration. You know, whether it works or not, I think remains to be seen. It's my first point. And the second point is, I think, uh, Anthony, and in some respects, a uh, dialogue. Uh, mentioned about Hong Kong needs to prove that we are useful to mainland China. Well, I, it also kind of fits my kind of uh, framework, right? But I think this uh, this argument uh, has been valid maybe before 2020. But now we have seen a more prescriptive approach from the central government. We have the Greater Bay Area, which already allocates Hong Kong's role. And Hong Kong is to be is to fulfill that role. And I remember some time ago, officials saying that, you know, there's a fast train in the platform. And Hong Kong, you are allocated a ticket with a good, with a, with a good seat. You know, not many people uh, uh, can have that ticket. So your choice would be to, to get on board on that train and then towards a better future for, for, whole, for all Chinese people. Or if you st still stand at the platform, that you know, you, you won't know whether there will be a next string available. So I would see the kind of narrative in particular in the past one or two years uh, uh, being, you know, Hong Kong, while we, well, of course we need to prove our advantages, but more importantly, there's already kind of a role given to Hong Kong. And the question seems to me is, is not rather not how we prove ourselves, but how we understand the situation how we understand uh, the Chinese political system, uh, the, way, the way it looks at all, so, uh, all sorts of things, including Hong Kong. And, and, and if not, do we have an alternative? Uh, but not uh, on board that train, you know? That's what Hong Kong people need to think about. And uh, finally, if, uh, is, there a, uh, is, is there an impossible mission? I think redefining may be a key word. Uh, we are, in particular, in the past one or two years, we have the redefinition of the uh, one country, two systems concept, uh, what democracy means, what universal suffrage means. So it's kind of redefining. But this may not be a negative uh, word because I think one country, two systems, you know, it was conceived in 1980s. From 1980s to 2040s, you know, there must be a continual redefining efforts. Uh, redefining approach, you know, by both uh, central government and Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong has tried very hard to kind of define or redefine the the way of life, the political system to our favor. And, and that's why we have the debate of genuine universal suffrage, Zhen Pou But now, you know, it seems, you know, the central government side is also redefining. So I will see this will be a, still a continuous dynamic process. And I think it remains important that how we uh, position Hong Kong, uh, how we um, develop an identity uh, which retains Hong Kong's characteristics, but within the Chinese identity, within the Chinese umbrella. So that's my response to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, we received one more question from Peter Jun, and I think we can address this in the last four minutes. So uh, one concern is whether Hong Kong's losing policy autonomy in the in the new in a new framework would affect governance. Uh, would affect the quality of governance of the Hong Kong SAR. So yeah, I know if you have any views on that. Well, let me try to <clears throat> respond to that. 
I think it depends on how, uh, what you mean by losing policy autonomy. Because uh, all along, under the basic law, Hong Kong SL government is responsible for deciding on what to do uh, in relation to matters within the scope of autonomy. Of course, if the government hasn't performed well enough, that will affect how people in Hong Kong look at the government. It will affect how Beijing look at uh, the Hong Kong as our government. And if uh, both the local people and also the central people's government are not happy, then of course, that will affect governance in a broad sense. And um, <clears throat> We have seen that the central people's government is increasingly uh, more uh, assertive in terms of pointing to problems in Hong Kong and expecting the ASL government to address those problems. I think that perhaps is a signal of uh, Hong Kong not doing well enough in the past. I think that is certainly another challenge uh, facing us uh, into the future. Uh, also, maybe because I'm speaking, let me uh, take up one of the points made by uh, Henry that uh, we have this uh, fast train uh, into the uh, GPA, and therefore we are given a ticket. So if we don't make use of the ticket, then we miss the, the chance. That is true, of course, but at the same time, it depends on the attitude of taking up the ticket and boarding the train. If you just board a train and Hong Kong doesn't have anything to bring into the, onto the train, in other words, we, we have lost our sense of uniqueness, our contribution, our comparative advantage, then we will just be a very passive passenger on the train. And compared to someone who's better prepared, who's more strategic, I think that will make a difference. And that's why I think uh, for us, the challenge is still uh, how to uh, demonstrate Hong Kong's critical value to the nation. And that value, I think, includes how we can relate to the wider world as well. Well, um... Very quickly, uh, very briefly, I, 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 I do have some concerns about you know the way recently you you know, uh, picking up the uh, mainland discourse um, too uncritically and 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 too quickly, um, in terms of um, definitions of certain social issues and as well as um, diagnosing uh, Hong Kong's uh, problems and, and and so on. Uh, while making reference to them, I, I think it's okay. But, you know, um, you know, taking all of them on board too uncritically would be would be a problem because uh, at the end of the day, we, we need to look back at um, um, Hong Kong's own positioning. Um, um, Again, you know, it's, it's back to the issues about you know how 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 much you are connected with the international community, as well as your, your relative uh, advantages. Um, taking on the train, of course, that would be important, but at the same time, there should be a role. Um, without knowing our own role and without knowing exactly you know how many stops along that train route, and uh, you know who are our neighbors, who are our partners what would be the division of labor and simply assuming that, you know, by plucking the connections, then everything would be all right. I, I tend to think that that would be far too simplistic. And as a result, um, I don't think that would be uh, necessarily be good governance. So at the end of the day, we really need to sit back and, and, and go back to the very fundamental issues about, you know, how, how you do positioning, how you evaluate uh, your strategic role, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, like, that's how we, we like uh, to well um, the kind of train metaphor, uh, I think uh, I, I'm not, not totally advocating this approach, but it seems that the central government is uh, is uh, giving less room or less kind of choice for Hong Kong, Hong Kong to really uh, to think about you know whether economic integration works or not. We remember the localism, you know, when it appears uh, like 10 years ago, people mainly talking about whether economic integration is good or not. But for, for the debate in the past you know, 10 years, there's been no viable alternative to, you know, what could Hong Kong be, you know, without in integrating uh, economically with, with mainland China. So I agree that we need to, uh, Hong Kong should remain distinctive. We should, uh, 
we should uh, understand our positioning. But increasingly, I think uh, as the kind of Greater Bay Area is uh, from from a kind of a conceptual plan to all sorts of reality, and we have seen all the new measures being uh, trialed in the Greater Bay Area and attracting Hong Kong people to 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 go. So at least the the GBA factor uh, uh, could not be ignored, you know, for Hong Kong, uh, both the government level and even for the individual level. So, so that's that that's that's my point of view. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ho, Professor Jen, and Professor Liu. Now it's twelve noon, so uh, we better stop here. Although uh, we are still seeing questions coming in, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, due to the time limit, we have to stop here and. Uh, just as a preview, uh, we this dialogue series will, will will hold throughout this year. So our next dialogue will take place will take place on January fifteen. Uh, we will be addressing the COVID nineteen strategy at the crossroad. And before we close, uh, I just would just want to thank uh, our support team today: Fiona from UST, Joyce, uh, Johnny, and Ivy here from at UHK. And thank you very much for everyone to who participate uh, in this discussion today uh, in this morning. And I hope that you enjoy it and, um, and stay tuned to our future dialogue series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.